This is Coding Math, Episode 8, Velocity. Now what this video starts is a series on basic physics like velocity, acceleration, gravity, friction, etc. As you go through these, you'll be creating a reusable particle object template that you'll eventually be able to use for animation in real-world projects. I should also add a disclaimer here that my use of the word physics is pretty loose. This isn't serious science class physics. It's more layman's physics, designed more to animate UI elements on a screen or objects in a game. If you're planning manned spaceflight, I'd suggest a more serious physics textbook. This series builds on the last couple of videos on vectors, so if you've been following along, you should be fine. But if you need to know more on this subject or need a refresher, you might want to check out videos 6 and 7. Now when we talk about velocity, we're talking about something moving, so we're talking about animation. So let's set the stage by creating a basic animation setup. We'll start with a basic template described in Episode 1. Then we'll call an update function and define that function. The first thing that this update function will do is clear the canvas. And the last thing it does before it exits is call request animation frame as we've done before in a number of other videos. All of the animation will be done in between these two statements. First, let's just draw an unmoving object at a certain position. As mentioned in the vector videos, a vector can be used to represent position. That's pretty obvious as a vector has X and Y properties, which are exactly what you need to specify a location when drawing something on the screen. So we'll create a vector up here named position, and we'll initialize it with an XY of 100, 100. If you're not clear what this vector create line is, again, check out the last video, video 7, where this vector library is defined. Now in the update function, we can draw a circle at the location represented by this vector. So we begin fill, we then create an arc using get x and get y of position, and then we fill the path. Now we can test this in Chrome. And sure enough, we have a circle being drawn at position 100, 100. Try initializing the vector with different values and see that the circle is always drawn at the location specified by the vector. Now while it looks like the circle is just sitting there, remember that we're actually clearing the screen and redrawing the circle many times per second. This would be stupid if we just wanted a stationary circle, but it makes sense once we start animating. So let's progress to velocity. Now it's easy to equate velocity with speed, but in fact speed is just one component of velocity. The other component is direction or heading. So speed says that this thing is moving so fast. Velocity says it's moving so fast and is heading in that direction. So velocity has a magnitude, the speed, and a direction. And that is exactly the definition of a vector. But speed itself has two factors as well, is distance and time. Speed is how far something moves in a given amount of time. Now the magnitude of a velocity vector will just be a single number, like 10. So we need to define what units that's in. Miles per hour, kilometers per second, light years per century, or pixels per frame. The last one, pixels per frame, is what we'll use here, since we're animating on a frame-by-frame -frame basis. Each time update is called, we'll move the object a certain distance and then render it. Just realize that a frame is sort of an arbitrary unit of time that's really dependent on an animation's frame rate. If your computer is older or there's some other heavy processing going on in the background, that frame rate could slow down. Also, if your program is doing a lot of calculations, that itself could slow down the frame rate or even cause it to skip frames. So when you say something will move at a speed of 10 pixels per frame, the speed you observe in real time may vary slightly, depending on the factors just mentioned. But for most non-critical animation applications, pixels per frame will work adequately. In a later video, I'll show you how you can program velocity as pixels per second, so that an animation will always run at the same speed, no matter what computer it's running on, or what else is happening on the computer. But for now, we can visualize this in terms of pixels per frame. This vector here represents the original position of an object. Say it's 100, 100. And this vector here would be the velocity. Let's say it has an x, y of 5, minus 5. We add the velocity vector to the position vector, and this gives us a new position that winds up being 105, 95. Because our time factor is one frame, this represents the position after exactly one frame. Now we can visualize this new position as a vector from the origin to the new xy point, or we can just realize that this is a new location point for the object. Now in the next frame, we add the velocity vector to the new position, and that gives us another new position vector of 110, 90. You keep adding the velocity vector to the position vector on each frame, 
and you get a resulting overall motion over time. Okay, so let's jump back to the code and go ahead and create a velocity vector. We'll initialize it with zero, zero values and set it using set length and set angle. We'll set the length to three, which again will mean three pixels per frame. And angle will be math pi divided by six radians, or 30 degrees. So the object should move down and to the right fairly slowly. Now we need to apply this velocity to the object. This is as simple as adding the velocity vector to the position vector on each frame. That's the perfect use case for the add to method we created. So we say position, add to, velocity, just before we draw the object. Now we can test this in the browser. And yes, the circle is moving down and across the screen. Try setting the speed and angle of the velocity vector to different values and see how that changes the motion. Verify that it actually moves at the speed and angle you specify. So that's about all there is to velocity. But we can probably organize this code a little bit better. If you think about a real life game or application where you wanted this circle to move across the screen, you probably wouldn't start creating velocity and position variables right in your main application code. In fact, if you had multiple objects moving around, you'd definitely have to reconsider how you did this. You'd most likely create a class or object template that represents this moving entity and encapsulates its properties and behaviors all into a single object. This kind of moving object is often called a particle. So we can create a particle object and move the position and velocity vectors into it. We'll create a new file called particle.js and we'll make sure that it's included by the HTML file. Then we can start creating the object in the same way we created the vector object in episode 7. So we create an object literal named particle and start populating it. Initially, the position and velocity vectors will be null. They'll be created in the create method. If we created them directly on the template object, they would be shared by all instances of this template. And that would mean that all your particles would have the same position and velocity, which would be useless. So create takes the initial xy position, the speed, and direction and it uses those to create the position and velocity vectors. So each time you create a new instance of this particle, it will get its own velocity and position vectors. And we can give it an update method as well, and move the velocity and position adding behavior into that. Now this particle knows how to add its own velocity to its position. Now we can easily create an instance of the particle. Then, in the update function, we just need to call pUpdate. And, of course, we need to adjust how we access the x and y position, as position is now a property of the particle. And we can test this in Chrome. And, sure enough, it's moving just like before. Now, to prove that this is a reusable object, and that we can have a bunch of different particles, each with its own position and velocity, we can create an array of particles rather than just a single one. And a variable num particles that says we're going to create 100 of them. Then we can loop through the specified number of times and fill this array with random particles. Each particle will get a position of width divided by 2, height divided by 2, so that it will be centered on the canvas initially and it's going to get a random speed and a random direction. Now, down here in update, we loop through again, call update on each particle, and draw each one. We check the browser, and bang, we have a sort of fireworks display. Admittedly, it's a bit of a lame one, but in the next few videos, we'll work on improving this. As a final word, you might be wondering about performance. Specifically, when you call update, this calls particle update, which calls vector add to, which calls vector get x, and vector get y. That's a whole lot of function calls, just to add a couple of numbers together. So I'll say that once we've fleshed out this particle object with a few more useful methods, I'll take a run through it and optimize it. But for now, we'll just leave it as it is so that it clearly shows the concepts we're working on. In the next episode, we'll look at adding acceleration and gravity into the mix. See you next week.